the average wage gain for an immigrant coming to the United States is a four-fold increase in that person's uh, wages. And that's because that person is more productive here in the United States because we have economic freedom, uh, we have some political freedom, and as a result, that allows people to be more productive. Mass immigration is not compatible with the goals and characteristics of a modern society in a way that wasn't necessarily true 100 or 200 years ago. Again, it's not because the immigrants are somehow inferior to your grandma who came from Sicily or anything like that. It's that we have changed fundamentally. Welcome to episode 139 of the Michaela Peterson podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. I have a headset on because I am backstage in Boston at one of my dad's shows. And these are very difficult to like figure out how to get on and off with all this hair. So I'm keeping it on. And this is the time I have to do an intro. So this is an opposing views episode. Opposing views is where I bring on two experts with opposing views on a generally contentious subject. Alex Narasta and Mark Krikorian came on to discuss immigration. Alex Narasta is the Director of Immigration Studies at the Cato Institute and author of several books, including the most common arguments against immigration and why they're wrong. My second guest was Mark Krikorian, an expert on immigration and the executive director at the Center for Immigration Studies, an independent nonpartisan research group established in DC in 1985 to provide fact-based immigration research. Quick shout out to these bad boys, Carnivore Crisps. We have a code in the show notes, but these guys are literally feeding my dad and I on this tour, feeding us. I cannot recommend them enough. It's just meat and salt. It's one of the only things I can eat that's packaged. Thank you, Carnivore Crisps. Enjoy this episode. Alex Narasta, welcome to my podcast. Thank you for having me. Before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? Sure. So I am an immigration policy expert working at the Cato Institute, which is a Washington, D.C.-based libertarian think tank. And primarily, I do original immigration research that gets published in peer-reviewed academic journals and policy white papers here at Cato. I also write for more popular publications like major newspapers and on blogs. And I try to work with policymakers here in Washington, D.C. to produce a better immigration policy. So would you say that uh, on this side of the opposing views, are you pro-immigration or are you anti-immigration? I'm very pro-immigration. Okay. So that kind of, uh, I saw that you're from the Cato Institute Libertarian Think Tank. I've talked to other people from Cato Institute. And for some reason, my initial view was this guy is going to be more right wing or anti-immigration. So that's where I started from anyway, but you're not, you're pro-immigration. So we should get into why you're pro-immigration. Yeah. So I think the main reasons there's, uh, there's several reasons, but I think the main one is that it's extremely economically beneficial for Americans and for the immigrants themselves to liberalize and allow more immigration into the United States. So when you take a look around the world, the average wage gain for an immigrant coming to the United States is a four-fold increase in that person's uh, wages. And that's because that person is more productive here in the United States because we have economic freedom, uh, we have some political freedom, and as a result, that allows people to be more productive. Uh, but unfortunately, we have a very strict series of immigration laws that make it impossible for the vast majority of people who want to come here legally to do so. And that restricts Americans' ability to hire and otherwise deal with these people. Mm. Another reason why it's important, I think, is part of our sort of uh, cultural uh, heritage here and our civic heritage in the United States. And we're not the only country in the world that has a strong immigrant tradition, right? You have Canada, Australia, New Zealand, other countries. But here in the United States, uh, we have a strong tradition of allowing people to come here legally, to work, to live, to eventually become Americans. And this has contributed mightily to the prosperity and individual freedom and liberty of this country. Just to give you an example, 
if immigration in the U.S. had stopped in the year 1800, today there would be fewer than 100 million Americans living in the country. And currently there are 330 million. And I don't think there's any person who would claim that the United States would be a wealthier, freer, uh, stronger uh, country if we had if there were fewer than 100 million of us uh, here today. And then I think also additionally, as being sort of um, a beacon uh, of liberty and of these sort of uh, classical liberal values in the world, it's very important to have a place where folks around the world who agree with those values uh, can come here, can live freely, uh, can practice that. And it's in the national interest of the United States. So this is not charity. You know, this is not something nice that the U.S. government does for other people, but it is basically them getting out of the way, allowing people to want to come here to help themselves, to be part of our country. And it makes Americans better off in the long run as well. OK, so you mentioned bringing people in that share our values. So I think part of the more I don't more conservative argument would be that there's an influx of immigrants they don't have very much skill. They're taking away jobs from Americans and they don't share our values. And that's kind of watering down, I guess, American freedom. So you have a response to that. Does any of that seem accurate? Well, that's that's a, that's an argument made by a lot of folks who are you know skeptical or opposed to immigration. And it's the same argument that's been made um, since the 1700s in this country. It was made about the Irish, the Germans. Uh, Chinese, Poles, Russians, Jews, et cetera, back in the 19th and, and, and century and earlier. And it's the same arguments that are made today about current immigrant groups. And when we take a look at the evidence, it simply isn't there. So, for instance, like some of the most uh, the most well-known economists uh, who studies the impact of immigration on wages, for instance, uh, in the United States is George Borjas from Harvard University. And what he found is from 1990 to 2010, uh, immigrants to the United States um, increase the wages of native born Americans uh, by about half a percentage point overall. And the only potential area where there was sort of a slight decline in wages, a relative decline in wages, uh, were those who Americans who are high school dropouts, who are about 8% uh. of the US population. And that's the most He's a well-known economist, George Borjas, but that's the most negative finding in the entire academic peer-reviewed literature. Uh, another mm -hmm. series of economists, uh, Giovanni Perry and uh, Gianmarco Ottaviano, they found that uh, the wages of all Americans went up by about the same, about half a percentage point, but that native-born American high school dropouts wages rose roughly by about 1.1%. And that gap, that negative 1.7 to 1.1%, is where this entire debate is among economists who study this. And this doesn't take into account all the other big effects on the economy, the enormous amount of additional productivity. For instance, like immigrants are more than twice as likely to start businesses as native born Americans, uh, more than twice as likely to patent as native born Americans and, and, and to innovate mm. as native born Americans are. And so that, that sounds a little weird to people, right? Like why would an enormous number of new immigrants not lower wages? Right. That yeah. sounds kind of weird. Right. You have this big increase in supply, but the price doesn't go down. And there's a lot of answers to that. But the most obvious one is that, you know, immigrants are people and they buy things and by buying things, it increases demand. And so by having more demand, that, that general effect of having that more demand and an increase in supply uh, when the economy reaches equilibrium again is that wages are slightly higher in the United States. OK. So we're only talking, so this entire argument really only comes down to people who don't have a high school degree. That's basically, if you're looking for a negative economic impact on the wages of Americans from immigration, it's basically about high school dropouts in the United States, who are about eight to 9% of the adult population. But even then, there's vast amounts of uh, disagreement over that. And it's important to clarify when I say these wage increases or decreases, these are not an absolute wages. This doesn't mean like a paycheck goes down. It just means that relative to other education groups, they haven't grown as much. So when you take a look ah. at like wage, yeah. So it's kind of like this funky econ thing. Like I have a background in economics and this is basically the only way that you can really measure it. So the wages of these folks have gone up 
over these time periods. It's just that they've probably gone up a little bit slower than they otherwise would because of the large amount or large number of immigrants who have come in. And are we even sure that that's the cause? So we're pretty sure there are lots of reasons why rage, wages are growing lower uh, or, or wages are growing at a slower rate for lower skilled Americans. You know, one is technology has changed a lot. So it's just there's higher returns to scales, uh, higher returns to your labor. If you have more skills, if you're more educated, the economy's changing. Um, you know, it's not like the 1950s anymore when anybody can get a job in a factory because now to work in a factory, you have to have a ton of skills. So I think it's more due to a factor of the change in economy. And we actually see that in places like Japan, which let in very, very few immigrants. The same wage dynamics are playing out there as they are in the United States. And that's highly suggestive evidence that there is just a bigger shift in the economy and immigration really isn't playing that big of a role in it. Interesting. Okay, cool. What about then the concern that you have people, okay, say what's happening in Europe at the moment, in some areas in Europe where there's an influx of people with a different religion coming in. And that's changing what's going on in some of these cities, parents, for instance. And I probably come at this from more of a right-wing angle, but that's what I've like read and what I've seen. So I think that some of the concern about immigration lies in, oh, are we going to have an influx of people that like I said, don't share American values. And then is that going to end up being a problem in the future? Right. So that's that's an important point. I actually wrote a whole book about this because it's, I think, potentially the most devastating uh, counter argument to my position. So the book is called Wretched Refuse and it's published at Cambridge. And, and the idea is and, and I also want to say, you know, immigration is different in different countries, right? They mm -hmm. have different issues and it depends on where the immigrants are coming from. Partly, it also depends on the institutions in those countries. So to give you an example, uh, immigrants in Europe usually have access to an enormous amount of means tested welfare benefits immediately after coming into these countries. And in the same token, these countries have a lot of labor market regulations that make it very diff difficult for lower skilled immigrants to get jobs, to get like a, a, a step up. Right. So you have this bad situation where you have a high unemployment situation for immigrants and they get a lot of welfare benefits, which makes it less likely that they work. And then mm. they're sort of by law kind of not unintentionally, but unintentionally through these welfare benefits and public housing, sort of like segregated and housing complexes and parts of the city where they don't interact um, with, with natives in that area. So I think it has more to do with that. Whereas in the United States, you have a situation where there's very little access of new immigrants to means tested welfare benefits. You basically have to work like the first thing that you do as an asylum seeker in the U.S. is you have to get a job or as a refugee, you've got to get a job. In Europe, there are laws where it says if you're an asylum seeker or refugee, you can't get a job sometimes for several years because they're worried about you competing with native born people. And as a result, that has all these effects where you're not interacting with natives, there's not really that opportunity to economically assimilate, there's not that opportunity to culturally assimilate. And that also affects the types of people who are gonna go. Because the type of person who's gonna go to a country where you have to work and pull yourself up is mm. different than the type of person who's gonna go to a country where they can live on uh, welfare and these other uh, issues for a long time. And then there's also just like a cultural difference, right? Like in the US and Canada and Australia, you know, these are immigrant societies where their identity is not based on uh, blood or borders or culture nearly as much as in the United States, Canada and Australia, where we have this idea of what it means to be an American, for instance, is not based on like the color of your skin or your blood or, or anything like that. But it's much more of sort of a, a creed. It's much more of an ideological or a civic identification. And the nation states of Europe that's a little different, right? It's based on your membership of these tribes, right? Mm -hmm. Are, can you claim like a, you know, a descent from the Frankish tribe that settled France in the year like 500? Can you trace your ancestry back in some ways to like the ancient Gauls and Vercingetrix? That's just much more tied into it. So I, I have a cousin who is uh, half Iranian and half Norwegian. And just this, this is just an anecdote, but she lives in Norway. And she's, when she says she's Norwegian, Norwegians correct her and say, no, you're something uh, else. Whereas here, if, you know, an American were to say, oh, I'm not an American, I'm like Iranian, Americans are kind of offended to go, no, you're American. 
And that's just like a very opposite thing. It's starting to change a little bit in Europe because they are becoming more immigrant societies. But that's something that can only really happen once the definition of what it means to be German or French or Norwegian sort of grows to encompass uh, the immigrants and their descendants. That's very interesting. Okay. This is why so I like these, these episodes. <laughs> this is good. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really like a, a superpower, actually. It's, it's one way, uh, one of many ways, I think, in which the United States is quite exceptional. And it's something, you know, I think Canada does well. I think Australia, New Zealand, all these countries do, I think, pretty well on this idea. And it's something that the rest of the world is starting to learn and pick up on. And they're going to have to adopt um, no matter what happens in the future. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. What about the issue right now? Like what percentage of immigrants right now in America? I don't know if you know this number off the top of your head, but are illegal. About 25%. Really? Yeah. So okay. there, there's about 45 million or so immigrants in the United States and somewhere between about 10 and 12 million are currently uh, illegally present in the United States. Um, about half of them entered legally actually and overstayed their visas. So they mm. became illegal immigrants that way. The other half uh, crossed the border uh, or otherwise entered unlawfully and stayed. So around 12% or something like that. Um, well, around 10 to 12 million, about 25%. Okay. Wow. Okay. And, and just to put that in perspective, right? Like that is a vastly greater percentage of the immigrant population that's illegal in the US than any other country in the world. Vastly greater. Yeah, vastly. And is that because of the border between the U.S. and Mexico? So I think there's two reasons. One of it is we're basically the only developed country that borders a developing country. So if you take a look at Europe, like the land borders, for instance, I mean, they basically all border countries that are pretty developed uh, by comparison. You know, Canada borders the United States, which is developed. Australia doesn't have a land border. Neither does New Zealand. Um, so that's, I think, part of it. So there's this enormous wage pull. Like your sort of median Mexican worker coming to the U.S. who has a high school degree can expect a threefold increase in income by coming here. Yeah. And that takes account of and that includes cost of living. Right. So that's an enormous economic pull for these folks to come here and to walk from Central America. And I think the second reason is people don't realize how difficult it is legally for the vast majority of these people to come here. I mean, if you want to come here on a green card and you are not related to an American or another legal immigrant, and you're not highly skilled, and you're not one of a few refugees or asylum seekers, there is basically no way for you to come here on a green card. Like there is no green card category for a low skilled worker unless you're related to an American. And so like if you apply these laws that we have right now, these immigration laws back in time, virtually no Americans would be here today because very few of us, would, our ancestors would have qualified to come here legally. Do you think that's reasonable given the population of the U.S. right now? No, no. I mean, what's what's interesting, right, is the U.S. does have 330 million people. It's the third most populous country in the world, but it's also a very large country. And so when you take a look at the sort of number of people per square mile in the United States, uh, we could have, um, you know, five to six times as many people here. And we'd have the population density of some Western European countries, you know, that are very, mm. you know, wealthy, stable, industrialized, uh, successful countries. So I don't think there's really any sort of uh, limitation in terms of land area or space or economic system. I mean, one of the great things about uh, free markets and capitalism, and I don't pretend the U.S. is a free market uh, utopia or anything like that, but we do have relatively more free markets than most other countries in the world. But one of the great things is having more people come in who are producers, who are consumers, who are innovators, who are entrepreneurs, or just want to spend their money here, you know, renting and, and living, uh, that increases the size of the economic pie. And that increases the amount of, of wealth and productivity, right? It's not like a redistribution. There's not a fixed supply of wealth that's being distributed around. They actually grow the, and increase the amount of wealth. And that's one of the, you know, one of the secret powers of, uh, of free markets. And it's one of the reasons why the world is so much more, so much wealthier than it is today. It's than it was, you know, for our ancestors and just the relatively recent past. And so there's really no limitation 
on this except what the market puts a limitation on. I mean, if there's no demand for workers, if there's no demand for foreigners to come here and start businesses, then they won't come. But there is obviously an enormous demand, which is why people break our immigration laws, uh, because our laws make it so difficult to come. I mean, one of the things that people don't realize about American immigration laws is that compared to other OECD countries, other rich countries in the world, America's laws are more restrictive than most of them. So Western European countries, Canada, Australia, all allow in many more immigrants as a percentage of their population than the U.S. does. So for Canada, it's like three times as many annually compared to the United States as a percentage of the population. Australia, it's about five times as many. Switzerland, it's six times as many. So the U.S., you know, I think we're rightly proud of our immigrant ancestry and our history and our, our values in this sense. But when you take a look at current American laws, um, you can't come away with any impression except that it's highly restrictive and much more restrictive than other countries that don't even think of themselves as having a proud immigrant heritage. It's interesting talking to you. So you have the view, I think, that you bring more people in and then, hooray, we have more helpful people here, more smart people to help improve the country. And the other side is you bring more people in and you have a whole bunch of unhelpful people you have to take care of. I think that's a fair characterization, right? And and I think this comes down to just like a basic difference in how you view these things. Like I don't view immigration as charity. And this is something where I disagree with some of my left-wing friends who are pro-immigration. You know, the way they talk about it is, oh, immigration is us helping the world or us yeah. helping people. And it's like, it's not helping. It's the U.S. government getting out of the way so that immigrants can help themselves and so that Americans can also benefit by working with them and selling to them and hiring them. So it's a mutually beneficial and voluntary exchange, right? It's like in the same sense where if, you know, I talk to my neighbor who's a native born American, right? And I say, hey, I'll hire you a kid for $10 to mow my lawn. Well, what's the difference between that? Everyone realizes that's like mutually beneficial and positive. But all of a sudden, if I go and ask somebody from Mexico, hey, do you want to come over and work for me and I'll pay you $10 to mow my lawn? All of a sudden, that's like viewed as bad. And there's really no economic reason why that is. There's no good economic justification for that. You know, there might be other effects, right? If that person is a criminal, yeah, that's bad. And I am in favor, of course, in blocking you know, criminals, national security threats, people who have serious communicable diseases from coming to the U.S. But other than that, there's no good economic reasons to, to stop that. I guess the concern there would be, for some reason, if you're paying an illegal immigrant, then the money they're earning isn't staying in America. Maybe it's being shipped off somewhere else. So some of that definitely is right, whether it's an illegal immigrant or, or a legal immigrant or something. I mean, a lot of them do send a good amount of their money uh, back to their home countries. But based on how sort of the international economics works, those dollars have to also come back to the United States in the form of American exports to those countries, right? So an American might hire, let's say, a worker in the United States to work at his business. That immigrant might send half of that money back to his home country, let's say Mexico. And then his family in Mexico uses that money to buy better education or to buy a better house, et cetera. But then that money, as it works its way through the Mexican economy, eventually makes its way back to the United States in the form of Americans exporting like iPads or cars back to Mexico, right? So, and it's important to know mm. like that initial wealth, right? Like that initial creation of that wealth of me or that American hiring that Mexican immigrant creates goods and services that would not have existed otherwise. And as a result, that's what makes us wealthy, right? What makes us wealthy is not like the dollar number on our bank accounts or anything like that, but it's what you can do with that money, right? And we have access to goods and services. That's what makes us wealthy. You can mess around with the numbers all you want, but so long as we have access to houses and healthcare and cars and all this great stuff, material stuff that does improve the quality of our lives, that's the measure of what makes us wealthy. And what immigration does just fundamentally is it's more people who are workers and entrepreneurs who increase the supply of stuff and services that Americans want, that the immigrants want, and that makes us all wealthy or wealthier than we would be otherwise. Okay. I can wrap my mind around that. <laughs> so you said compared to Europe, there's a 
complete difference in the, you said means tested welfare benefits. So what does means tested mean exactly? So means tested welfare benefits are welfare benefits for people who are poor, um, which is sort of different from like entitlement programs, which are like social security or Medicare, which are for people who are elderly. Um, you know, so they sort of just qualify for it based on, oh, they worked a certain number of years and they're of a certain age. So they get these benefits. Meanwhile, means tested benefits are for people who are in poverty and they are uh, they are intended to help people get out of poverty or at least make poverty, um, you know, more, um, I don't know, tolerable for them. OK, I didn't realize that I should have thought about this probably before this podcast, but I didn't realize that different countries bring in different sets of people. So it's not that everyone is specifically looking for skilled labor. Some people are doing it, like you said, out of charity. And so you said right now, when, when people, when the America brings immigrants in, you know what percentage of that is specifically skilled workers? So when you take a, when you take a look at sort of the, um, there's different portions of the US immigration system. So if you look at green cards and green cards are lawful permanent residency. That it means that if you're here for five years, you don't commit any crimes, uh, then you can become a citizen if you want to. It's what we sort of traditionally think of like immigration. And there is basically four major portions of this. 70% are family members. About 5% are what are called diversity visa, which is basically like a lottery for 50,000 people who are, um, you know, they're, they have some skills, but they're not coming for their skills necessarily. There's another about 5% or so who are refugees and asylum seekers who are fleeing persecution. And then you have somewhere around seven to 10% who are specifically coming to the United States because they are high skilled workers. And when you take a look at the numbers, it's somewhere around 70 to 80,000 per year. Um, some people will say it's 140,000, but that's the total number of people who can get these green cards for high skilled workers. But that includes their family members because you have to count their young children and spouses against that. But for the workers themselves, it's about 70 to 80,000. Um, there are temporary visa programs called the H1B for high skilled workers. Um, they come in for three to six years. They're able to work and get some extensions sometimes. And we allow in about 85,000 of those types of people per year to work temporarily in those programs. And uh, that's for firms. What's interesting is, you know, I work at a nonprofit research institution. There's an exception to the H-1B that says um, there's no numerical limitation on the number of people who can come in and work at nonprofit research institutions. So what's interesting is people like me and people who work at universities, I am more exposed to foreign high-skilled competition than just about anybody else in the U.S. labor market. To put That's that in perspective. That's so interesting. Why would that be specifically for nonprofits? specifically for nonprofits who are doing research. So that was just an exception that was built into the law in 1990. And the idea was, you know, we don't want to limit the sort of temporary hiring of skilled people who are doing research because, you know, Congress yeah. is like, hey, research is pretty good. We want more research. It helps. Uh, we don't want to artificially limit that. And so this is sort of was expanded to the idea that like nonprofits who do research um, should have, you know, access to these people. Now, there's a whole bunch of regulations in there. You know, you have to pay a minimum salary of $60,000 per year. You have to check a bunch of other boxes. It costs thousands of dollars, sometimes upwards of $10,000 in legal and government fees to do this, yeah. right? So it's not like you just get to pick and grab anybody you want, right? It's highly regulated. Um, but when it comes to that, right, people will... Um, people like myself are the most exposed to this foreign competition and a large, a, a fairly large number of my colleagues are either currently H1B employees or entered the United States initially as H1Bs. And then they were eventually be able, uh, they're eventually able to get um, uh, citizenship in the United States. Yeah. Well, wow. so, so I'm think... speaking, so I'm speaking from a position of experience, right? Like I, I do face this type of like competition. It's not like I'm in an ivory tower, right? Where mm -hmm. I'm saying, Oh, you little people, you have to compete. No, I'm not saying that at all. <laughs> this is something, this is something that I live uh, day in and day out. And it's something that I think has made me a better 
um, a better employee. At least I hope so. And it's something where I've, I've, I've gained a lot of professional uh, acquaintances and colleagues who have made me just a much uh, better and more productive uh, employee as a native born American. What about the argument that uh, an increase in immigration increases crime? Is there any truth behind that? So we've taken a look at this. Americans uh, have studied this. I've studied this going back over a century. There have been numerous government commissions that have taken a look at this. The academic evidence is, is clear and consistent that um, immigrants in the United States, um, and this is specific to the United States, I just want to be clear that, about that, are much less crime prone than native born Americans, much less likely to be incarcerated, much less likely to be convicted of crimes than native born Americans, much less likely to be arrested. Um, that, and that goes for uh, legal immigrants. And interestingly enough, it goes for illegal immigrants as well. So um, that kind of makes sense to me, though, because if you're already here illegally, the probably the, the thing you want to avoid most is getting arrested. Absolutely. Because if you get arrested for a crime and you're convicted of a crime and you're an illegal immigrant, you serve your jail sentence. And then on top of that, you get deported. So it's like a double punishment. Ooh. Right. Yeah. So so it's like, OK, I came to the U.S. I got three times higher wages. If I commit a crime, I'm going to go to prison. I'm going to lose, lose those years of wages and prison is terrible. And at the end of it, I'm going to be deported back to my home country. And I'm, my income is going to fall by, you know, two thirds or 75%. So that's an enormous disincentive. And I think also another way to, to view it, right? Like even when there wa weren't deportations in the United States in the 19th century, there were hardly any deportations in the early 20th century too. It's also, I think the type of person who decides to immigrate is different than the type of person who doesn't. The type of person, right? And this is something like when we're talking about immigration from, from Muslim countries or other places going, it's not the average person from those countries who come. It's not like a random grab bag. It's people who decide to leave. And those people are different. They're thinking about the long term for themselves and their family. They're concerned about their as you sort of upward mobility. They're planning ahead. They're probably more cosmopolitan and tolerant to begin with. They don't really care that much about living in the society where people speak a different language or have a different religion. They're just like less concerned about that than other people from behind. And those people, I think, are just generally much less likely to want to commit crimes than native born uh, um, Americans are. Now, th this data may differ between countries, of course. This is one of the things to take account of. This is uh, I'm just talking about the United States in general. Um, but the problem is European crime data are awful. I mean, awful. I've spent a lot of time looking into the details of European crime data, and they do not differentiate in many countries between, you know, native born criminals, foreign born criminals. Uh, just to give you an example, in many European countries, if you're an immigrant and you become a citizen, they count you in the same category as native born people. For crime. And that makes it hard to figure out. Right. But in the United States, we keep that all separate because people have been worried about crime and immigration forever here. So we have the data and we, ca we categorize it, um, you know, and and one of the criticisms I get right is, well, you don't know about illegal immigrants necessarily. But one of the things I, I was able to find out is on U.S. states, U.S. states is where most criminal prosecutions are because most criminal laws are on the state level. Um, and forty nine out of 50 American states do not keep data on criminal convictions or arrests by immigration status. They don't. But one state does. It's a great state, the great state of Texas. Uh -huh. They keep this data. It's a great state to study. It has the second highest population of illegal immigrants of any state in the country. It borders Mexico. It has Republican government for the last uh, 27 years. So there's no reason why they would hide or obstruct this data in any kind of way. And so when you take a look at that, uh, you see that the illegal immigrant uh, criminal conviction rate is 37 percent below that of native born Americans. Wow. And it even works out that way when you take a look at specific crimes like homicide, uh, it's about 25% below native born Americans. You take a look at sex crimes, it's below. You take a look at property crimes, it's below. And then legal immigrants are even lower than that. They're about 60% below the native born American criminal conviction rate. And that is something, um, you know, I wish 
native born Americans uh, had a criminal conviction rate as low as illegal immigrants. This would be a much safer country if that were the case. Wow. OK, that's really interesting. I don't think I knew that. That's a huge difference. Gigantic. I mean, it's 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 gigantic. And this is something where government commissions going back over a century um, and a lot of these commissions in the past were put together by American politicians who are opposed to immigration. So they're trying to come up with justifications for trying to close the border. Yeah. But the one thing they and, and they said, you know, all this stuff about immigration was not true. But the one thing that they all agreed on was that immigrants, whether it's Italians or Jews or Russians, Mexicans, Chinese, anything much less likely to commit crimes than native born Americans. Hmm. OK, OK. So then he here's another question. Going back to skilled workers, do you think it's reasonable that it's only seven to 10 percent of immigrants that are let in that are skilled? Should that be dramatically increased? Yes. So I think a lot of the, the so I think overall the numbers should be increased. But um, if we were to just increase the number of skilled workers, I would take that deal in a heartbeat. Um, the thing that is, is interesting about the U.S. immigration system is that it basically it's an employer driven system. So the employers select high skilled immigrants and then they sponsor them. So the employers know like the workers who it's not necessarily the government saying they have to be this way or that way. You know, they have to have this skill, not that skill. It's the employer figuring that out. And that's a pretty good system for selecting sort of these unmet, these uh, unmeasurable characteristics of workers who are really going to succeed. So I would love to increase that number dramatically. I mean, I think if you get a degree from an American university and you're a foreign born student, you should have a green card immediately. You should be allowed to stay and work, start a business if you want to in the United States. There should be, I mean, I don't think there's any good reason for a numerical cap on skilled immigrants who want to come here to the United States. And even more, and even more insane, there's no entrepreneur visa. If you want to come here and start a business, there's no visa for you. You can't do it. And that's crazy. Like, why would we have that? What about the, okay, so I'm, I'm Canadian, right? And I'm planning on staying in the US because I don't want to go back to Canada because Canada's scary right now. But what we've been looking into is e there's an entertainer visa. So that that's what I'll that's what I have at the moment, an entertainment visa. So that's easy. But I, I heard about something called an E1 visa, I think, which at least I thought that that was a business visa. That might be that you're allowed to break, like move a company that's already made into America. So maybe it's just that. But an E1 visa definitely lets you do something business related. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah, so there, there, there's a bunch of different visas where uh, there's a couple of different visas where you can sponsor yourself as a high skilled person if you're sort of exceptional. But that's not specifically like if you wanted to come here from Canada and you're like, hey, I got this business idea. U.S. is the only place I can do it. Um, there is not a visa for that. Now, there is something called an investor visa where if you have a million dollars and you want to make an investment in the United States, then you can do that, but it's highly regulated. And it's basically how that works is you basically have to lump your money together with a bunch of other people who have a million dollars on this visa to build like a hotel or something. So it's not like you can come here and start like a tech firm, right? Um, and it, it, so there are ways to get around this with different visas. There are ways to sort of massage it. There are ways of being sort of exceptional on the O visa, for instance, for exceptional abilities. Uh, the first like EB1 visa, you know, you, you, you can have like exceptional abilities and you can come here, but it's not specifically uh, for starting a business. It's just that you can, but if you have like a great business proposal and you're like, I got funding, like million dollars, like seed funding. Sorry, you're out of luck. Like, that's not a visa that exists. Wow. Even if you have a source of funding from Americans? Yeah, from Americans. So what they can do is somebody hmm. can start a business in the United States and then they can hire you as an employee or they can okay, bring you in, in in different ways. But if you want to be like the founder who works, you know, 22 hours a day building a business from scratch and you want to come here and that's all you have is that idea and people who believe in you and want to fund it. Sorry. So you have like people who work on H-1B visas, which you have to work for an American company. They're high skilled people. They have business ideas. They work in Silicon Valley. They work all over the country. They want to start a business. 
they can't do that because you can't employ yourself and sponsor yourself on an H-1B visa. Wow. Yeah, that's harsh. I can see potentially why that was put in so that people starting businesses had to be American, but it's harsh if you, if you're a very talented person and you want to start a business or is. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't really understand the economics. Like um, if, if you're uh, in the United States, I think we would want to attract, you know, foreign businesses and, and entrepreneurs to start businesses here um, in the United States. I mean, one of the, one of the great things about the tax cut and jobs act, which was, um, you know, uh, signed by president Trump was that they changed a lot of the rules like the corporate tax laws and some of the other laws to make it easier for people to get financing, to have, um, you know, to keep more of the Hmm. profits of their firms. Uh, But then on the same token, so it's like an acknowledgement, like we want firms to move here. We want them to invest in the United States. We want them to create job opportunities for Americans and others. Oh, but we're not going to create, you know, we're not going to let them do it directly by coming here as entrepreneurs. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's tricky. Okay. Well, that was very interesting. I don't think I, I think I covered the main arguments. Is there anything you think I missed? I think one of the things people are really worried about is, um, I think there are two things. One is sort of the, the, the chaos. You know, I think people see chaos along the border and they see chaos with illegal immigration and that makes them become more skeptical of immigration overall. Yeah, definitely. And I understand that perspective, right? Like I, I, I understand that. I don't like chaos. I want sort of an orderly, an ordered system of liberty. But the reason why people cross the border illegally is because for almost all of them, there is no way for them to do it legally. And if we want people to respect the laws, the laws need to be respectable. They need to be enforceable. They need to take account of economic realities. Because the one thing we know is that when law goes in conflict with reality, reality always wins. Always. We see that with prohibition. We see that with mask mandates. We see that with everything across the country and our human experience. So what the way that we diminish chaos along the border, the way that we shrink this black market, and I'm all in favor of shrinking black markets, is not by more enforcement. It's not by building higher fences or walls or hiring more border patrol agents or doing interior immigration enforcement. It's by making it possible for more of these folks to come here legally, to work legally, to work in the legal market, and to do so in a way that can be regulated because the government cannot regulate black markets. It can only regulate a legal market. But the first problem is Immigration in the United States is so restricted and so complicated that it's impossible to do that. Um, you know, one of the most common saying by law professors about this topic is that the income, uh, the the uh, immigration laws are the second most complicated portion of American law after the income tax. Yeah. And if you've ever dealt with the IRS, you know that's super complicated and super hard, right? So if we want to reduce chaos. We have to avoid the temptation of cracking down through enforcement and instead go the route of a little bit of liberalization. Let's allow some more people to come here legally so that we can get control over the over the situation. And that is what's going to work. And I, I think the second issue that a lot of people are concerned about is sort of like cultural assimilation. You know, do immigrants and their kids integrate and assimilate to American cultural norms? And the evidence on this is very positive. When we take a look at research from Jacob Vigdor and other economists who study this on issues of language, religiosity, civic participation, family size, income, education, et cetera, immigrants overwhelmingly by the third generation, so that's you know the grandchildren of the immigrants themselves, are indistinguishable from native-born Americans who have been here longer. And this has been the general finding for a long period of time. Some immigrant groups assimilate more quickly. You know, first generation, the immigrants are the second by their kids. Some take a little bit longer, maybe third to fourth generation, but it's going very well. And one of the best ways that it happens is actually through intermarriage. That jump starts it, right? So like, just to give you a personal anecdote, like my, um, my paternal grandparents are Iranian immigrants to the United States. So my father was born here. So he's second generation. Um, and, um, he married a woman, uh, my mother who, um, whose ancestors go back several generations. 
And as a result, like, I don't know anything about Iranian culture, right? I, I don't speak Farsi. I'm not a Muslim. I have never been there. I have no interest in it. I know probably a little bit more about the history than some people, right? I don't even like the food that much. It's just okay. And that's like a pretty, like, ordinary, normal, unexceptional tale of immigrant assimilation. Like, my father, uh, you know, bless him. I love him. He claims to speak Farsi. He speaks it like he's five years old with a Wisconsin accent. And uh, it's hilarious. So when you take a look at like third generation Hispanic immigrants in the United States, so these are the grandkids of a Hispanic immigrant who spoke Spanish. 78% of them are English only speakers. 22% claim to be bilingual, but I bet they speak Spanish about as bad as my father speaks Farsi. And 0% claim to be Spanish only. 0%. That, that's crazy. I guess that makes sense. Cause even if I look at like my ancestry. So all my great grandparents were immigrants. So it's back that far. But I mean, we're like Canadian, right? Yeah. And my, my parents were certainly Canadian and my grandparents maybe had a tiny, tiny bit of the language, but not really. So it, it, it is pretty quick in North America, at least from my anecdotal experience. And, th and that's the general experience, right? You know, I think we, we look back at American history or Canadian history or whatnot, and we have this idea at least when I was learning history, you know, the Irish came in the 1850s and 60s and we're reading about all these problems. And then we turned the page in the history book and it all worked out fine. But when we turn that page, that's 70 to 100 years that passed. And what's really good is taking a look at the current rates of assimilation of immigrants. It is virtually identical to immigrants from over 100 years ago. And so the pace of assimilation, the gaining of education, the gaining of experience, the self-identifying as being an American, uh, the religious traditions, the family size, all these measures that really, really measure matter, it's the same. And when you take a look at surveys about, say, like uh, patriotism, you know, how much do you love the United States? Do you think it's the best country in the world? Um, immigrants either have the exact same opinions about patriotism as native born Americans, or they're slightly more patriotic. And I think part of the reason is they understand that the places that they came from are not that good. So it's easy for me. Like when I was a kid once, I was complaining to my, uh, my immigrant grandfather about something in politics, right? Like I was upset that the Republicans didn't cut budgets enough uh, in the 1990s. And he's like, yeah, Alex, you know, that's, that's something to be upset about. And I understand you're mad about politicians lying, but no matter what you want to say about it, this is a lot better than in Iran, let me tell you. And <laughs> I'm like, I can't argue with that. <laughs> huh. Okay. Okay. Well, Alex, that was enlightening and interesting. If people want to find you online, where should they go? So I think there are two sources. One is at the Cato website, that's C-A-T-O dot org. And the other is on Twitter. And that is at Alex Narasta, all one word on Twitter. And you can find all of my work uh, on those two websites. I'm also on YouTube and everywhere else. So just, just Google me and Google Cato and you'll find all of our work. Great. And that's Alex, N-O-W-R-A-S-T-E-H on Twitter. Yes. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me. This episode is brought to you by Paleo Valley 100% grass-fed beef sticks. Paleo Valley is unlike other companies in the market. They're committed to making high-quality, clean products free of problematic ingredients and free from farming practices that harm the environment. Their products come from small family-owned farms right here in the USA, and their cows are never fed grains or antibiotics. I personally can't eat them because I can't eat spices because I'm a bubble person whose body explodes at the sight of pepper An exaggeration, but not really. But these guys ingredients are so clean. So amazing. There are no preservatives, fillers, just 100% American, 100% grass fed and finished beef from domestic regenerative farms and organic spices. They're great. It's a super easy way to lose weight. It's just switch your snack to something like this and the weight will come off, I swear. You can help your body and the environment by trying Paleo Valley's high quality protein today. Just head over to paleovalley.com and enter code MP for 15% off your first order. That's paleovalley.com with code MP for 15% off your first order. 
Mark Krikorian, welcome to my podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Before we get started, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? I run the Center for Immigration Studies. I'm executive director. I've been doing this uh, longer than I care to remember. Uh, I got my master's degree in international relations. Um, didn't get hired by the CIA, but that's okay. Actually, that worked out better. Um, and I kind of dumbed into the immigration issue, but um, once you get you know, the bug, once you get bitten by the immigration bug, you never let it go. So I've been running the center since 1995. And, uh, you know, I'm a writer and editor, and I sign the checks and do all of that kind of administrative stuff as well. So if you could sum up your view on immigration as in too many immigrants, we need more, immigration is bad, immigration is good. What's the short form? The short answer is immigration is too high. But why? Uh, the problem is that immig mass immigration is not compatible with the goals and characteristics of a modern society in a way that wasn't necessarily true 100 or 200 years ago. In other words, the immigrants really aren't all that different. Yeah, some of them come from different countries, but that's not really the important difference. The important difference is us. We have a post-industrial knowledge-based economy. We have a welfare state. Technology shrinks the world, which is a good thing in a lot of ways, but also complicates assimilation. So all of the concerns people have about immigration really are all just different facets of the same thing. They're kind of like that image of uh, blind men feeling different parts of the elephant and they don't realize it's all the same elephant. Well, it's the same kind of thing. If you're worried about whether it's security or assimilation or um, you know, welfare use, uh, the economy, the effect on employ on workers, it's all the same thing. Immigration is, was something that 100, 200 years ago in a pre-modern conditions was still, frankly, you know, created a lot of uh, controversy and tumult and problems for people. We were able to work those through much more easily than we are today. And again, it's not because the immigrants are somehow inferior to your grandma who came from Sicily or anything like that. It's that we have changed fundamentally. Okay. And we have most definitely changed fundamentally, but how do we know that we're at the point where we should be slowing down immigrants versus 100 years ago, given all the space in America? Well, uh, I mean, space doesn't really count because immigrants don't spread themselves out half an inch thick across, you know, sea to shining sea. They're moving into, you know, the same place as everybody else lives. So, uh, and, you know, even in open spaces, I mean, this is a sort of separate argument, but I mean, not a separate argument, it's part of this broader argument we value things like, uh, you know, access to nature, preserving open spaces and what have you. And, you know, the more people you add, inevitably, you're going to be cutting down more trees and paving over more uh, land. And, you know, to some degree, that's just part of what human civilization does. But immigration is driving that in a way that um, is different today because we are, as John Kennedy said when he wrote the book Nation of Immigrants, We've moved past the stage of, uh, you know, settling and pioneers and, oh, you know, covered wagons and all the rest of that. We're now a settled, mature society. And, you know, we have the largest number of immigrants uh, ever. We're about we're at about 47 million foreign born people. Now, obviously, our population is much larger, too. But the percentage of foreign born people in our population is just almost at the record level it reached before immigration was reduced in the 20s. And, you know, it's um, mm. when you've had enough to eat, you, you take a break and we need a pause at the very least to uh, enable the new people and the people who are here to knit together, to work out the um, the effects on workers, on wages and what have you, because if you get one batch, one large batch of immigrants, that will eventually the effects of that person on wages of those people on the wages and job opportunities of Americans will eventually work themselves out. But what we're doing is taking in more than one million people from overseas every year. 
So basically, we need a breather is really what it amounts to. And that breather it doesn't mean no immigration. It just means less immigration. And I can go into detail on that if you want more uh, sort of what my uh, outline would be. But we need a breather so that we can, you know, catch our breath, as it were. And then we can reassess in a generation or so what it is we want to do with immigration going forward. So the guy I just spoke to, who was an economist, he said that you bring more people. This was his view, just kind of was summarized. this Narasta? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're familiar with him. Yes. That's good. Uh, but his, so then you're probably familiar with his view. But for the audience, his his view was basically the more people you br- bring in, particularly skilled labor, the more jobs are created, the more money gets spent, and overall, it's just a positive good for society. Yeah, you know, I mean, I actually would prefer to go even step a little further back from that argument. I'll get to that argument of his as well. But the basic difference I have with the libertarian perspective that Narasta uh, from Cato uh, articulated is much more fundamental than just the question of economics, because the perspective that Alex represents is that everyone in the world has a right, literally a moral right to move to the United States with the certain exceptions we might make for terrorists and what have you. In other words, everybody can come except those few that we identify as not being allowed to come. The way I look at it, and this is frankly most regular people's point of view, is that nobody has a right to move here, but we make exceptions for particular people we do let in. So either everybody gets to come in and we make some exceptions or nobody gets to come in and then we make some exceptions for those people who do get to come in. That is a basic difference of values and opinion. You've really got to get past that before you get to the point of arguing what the effect on workers is going to be. Um, But there's no question that more people make the economy bigger. Uh, You know, Bangladesh has a bigger economy than Belgium, for instance. But nobody would say that Bangladesh is better off than Belgium. Uh, The fact is that um, the one of the points of immigration policy is to protect American workers, but most specifically those who are less able to uh, thrive and prosper in the kind of dynamic modern economy we have, whether it's people who have less education, people who just aren't that bright. There's always, you know, half of people are below average, whether it's people who are recovering addicts, um, ex-cons trying to clean up their act and start a new life. Anybody that employers would kind of rather not hire is harmed by immigration. The people who benefit are, frankly, People like Alex and you and I who have college educations and we earn reasonably good wages and immigrants aren't really competing with us. But as an American, in thinking about immigration policy, I need to take into account not only my bottom line, whether I'm going to be able to hire servants cheaper or what have you, but rather the concerns of all of my fellow Americans And, you know, those people who are, um, you know, sort of at the bottom rung for whatever reason of the um, economic uh, ladder are people who deserve our special consideration. And immigration policy is a torpedo aimed at their life opportunities. Hmm. Okay. This is a very, no wonder you've been stuck in this topic for so long. It's really interesting because you're, you're weighing the benefits to different people, right? So your, yeah. your position is America, Americans, even if they're less able to work, but or especially if they're less able to work, they need to be taken care of properly. And they shouldn't have people from other countries kind of usurping that position, making their life more difficult. Yeah, because immigration is just like any other government policy. It creates winners and losers. It has costs and benefits. And um, to put some numbers on those costs and benefits, I'm not going to bore people too much, but the National Academies of Sciences did this magisterial report where they looked, you know, it's hundreds of pages long. They looked at all different aspects of this issue. And on the economics, the conclusion they came to 
is that importing immigrant labor does in fact create a economic net benefit to the country. The round numbers, then this was several years ago, so it will have changed, but round numbers, they said <clears throat> about $50 billion in extra income, extra earnings for Americans overall. And so that sounds like a lot. I'd take half of that and be satisfied. Um, but when you sort of figure out, remember, a net is the plus and the minus put together, and then what's the result? What they did is they looked at how do you get that number? And they said immigrant labor uh, creates increased earnings for the people who benefit from that labor amounting to $550 billion. It's a lot of money. Even for a congressman, that would be a lot of money. But it comes at the expense of people who compete with them who lose $500 billion in earnings. So just to sort of spell out the math, again, roughly speaking, $550 billion plus but 500 million minus for less skilled workers and others. And so you add those together, you end up with a net benefit of $50 billion. Again, not anything to, um, you know, to ignore, but the question is really a moral one. Is mm -hmm. it right to engage in that kind of reverse Robin Hood government policy? And I just think it's wrong. Wouldn't it benefit a society as a whole, though, to operate in the way that you and as harsh as, as it sounds, bring in more skilled people and then reduce the number of less skilled people. I mean, overall, if that improves society, is that the, not a net benefit? What are we doing with the less skilled people? Are they going anywhere? Uh, apart from the moral question, um, where are they going? What are we paying them off with welfare to sort of here, take your opioids and here's your check and your EBT card and leave us alone. We'll have the police come if you cause trouble. That's just wrong. I mean, I don't want to live in that kind of society. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the other thing this National Science, uh, National Academies of Sciences report found, because what we were talking about is the economic benefit, just the sort of dollars and cents from earnings and wages. The other thing they looked at was uh, government services. And what they found is that that entire benefit of roughly 50 billion is totally wiped out by the extra social service costs that we have to pay because poorer people, they're working, but they, you know, in a modern society, a person with a sixth grade education is not very likely to be able to earn enough money to feed his own children. So the taxpayer does it for him. And about half of immigrant headed families use at least one federal welfare program. It's not because there's anything wrong with them. They're not, you know, plotting to get food stamps. Um, you know, in, uh, nobody's sitting in Guatemala saying, boy, I want to get my hands on some American food stamps. They're coming here. They're working. They may be working two jobs. But because they're a mismatch, because they're 19th century style workers coming into a 21st century society, even though they get jobs, they're not going to, those jobs just aren't going to pay very much. And Congress can pass all the laws it wants about minimum wages and what have you. Fact is, you can't pay somebody more than the economic output they're creating. And so a poorly educated person, immigrant or American, just isn't going to earn a much and isn't going to be able to support himself and his family in a way that a civilized society like ours thinks at least there should be a minimum. So taxpayers are going to do it. And I'm not against a social safety net. I'm a conservative personally. I think it should be more tightly run. It should be more responsible, but it's not going anywhere and it shouldn't go anywhere. And as Milton Friedman said, you can't have open borders and a welfare state. Now, Milton Friedman and other libertarians wanted to get rid of the welfare state and open the borders. Okay, well, we're not getting rid of the welfare state. And even if you wanted to go and do that first, then call me and then we'll talk about immigration. Okay. What if, what if immigration looked more like not bringing in any unskilled workers and only bringing in the skilled workers? Sure. It's a good question. Um, there's uh, two parts to that. First is uh, this, most people who want to immigrate are in fact less skilled because once you're you know, living a reasonably prosperous, stable, satisfactory life in your own country, 
why would you pick up and move somewhere else? Some people do that, but it's not generally a mass phenomenon. That's yeah. number one. Number two, it depends. You remember uh, Bill Clinton said uh, it depends uh, on the meaning, what the meaning of the word is, is in that notorious uh, interview of his 25 years ago. Well, it depends on what the meaning of skill is. What do you mean by skilled? Do you mean somebody who can read and write? Do you mean someone with a college degree from a, you know, a, a third world community college? Or do you mean Albert Einstein? And um, the higher you set the bar for skills, the smaller the number of people who could qualify. So I'm completely in favor of genuinely best and brightest on the planet immigration. But humanity doesn't create that many Einsteins every year. So um, a small number of genuinely top people on the planet in their fields, I'm all for. That's not that many people. Um, <clears throat> and one more twist to that. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, skilled immigration actually can create assimilation problems, which people wouldn't expect. Because almost all skilled immigrants, wherever you sort of draw that, wherever you set the bar of skills, somebody's gone to college in a foreign country, they probably have some English. Even if they're not native speakers, even if they didn't major in it, they probably know some English. So skilled immigrants are going to be more likely to speak English. They're more likely to be acclimated to urban life. You know, they're not, they're not living on dirt floors and huts. You know what I mean? These are people who at least yeah. know the basics of modern life. So in that sense, you'd figure, well, they're probably more likely to be able to assimilate. <clears throat> and in those respects, that's true. But interestingly enough, and we found out this in earlier waves of immigration, if people are coming already educated here, they've gone through a school system, a socialization process in their own country, they have developed a national identity in a way that, frankly, peasants haven't. In other words, they've gone and learned about how, you know, the sort of the glories of their nation and how they're part of this national enterprise. And then they come here and they may fit in as far as getting a job and driving on the right side of the road. But assimilation, real assimilation is a psychological and emotional process. Do you adopt this new country? as your people. And that's just, frankly, less likely to happen with people who are highly educated. Whereas if you get, for instance, a, a, a Mayan speaking person from the highlands of Guatemala, doesn't know much Spanish, frankly, let alone English, but also doesn't think of himself in a, as, as a member of a nation in a modern sense likes his village, you know, his region maybe, but not a nation. That's where we could come in and, and have in the past nationalized, Americanized those people. So they keep their village traditions and cultural practices and cuisine and what have you, but patriotically become Americans. We saw that 100, 150 years ago. The problem, of course, is that our schools are not doing that very well at all. They're teaching American kids and immigrant kids to hate America. So um, anyway, the point is that skills, um, changing immigration to skills is not some kind of silver bullet that fixes everything. Hmm. This is very interesting. Okay. This is great. So then do you know the statistics behind one of, one of the concerns I've heard from more conservative people are more immigrants equals more crime. You know, the statistics behind that? No, that's actually not true. Um, and this is something um, I mean, it's I won't say it's the opposite or anything. Narasta tries to sort of flip that argument and say it's the other way around. The fact is, the data is not very good, but it is pretty clear that immigrants themselves are not uniquely more likely to be engaged in crime. The reason the issue comes up and, and people kind of who, who, you know, look at this regular folks, they confuse things, is that those immigrants who do commit crimes need to be booted out of the country. And the left is act actively trying to prevent that and make sure that illegal immigrant criminals are able to stay. So the issue is not that illegal immigrants are criminals, it's that those illegal immigrants who are criminals need to be identified <clears throat> and removed from the country. 
And sanctuary cities, the whole point to a sanctuary city is to protect illegal immigrant criminals. However many, if there's one illegal immigrant who's a criminal, that's obviously one too many. That person needs to go. Um, and that's the issue. It's not that immigration itself is some kind of unique contributor to crime. The one place that, um, that, that is kind of an exception is organized crime. And the reason that's true is that um, criminal organizations don't have courts and contracts and nobody's enforcing the rules. There needs to be some kind of internalized code that would cause you to stick to whatever the rules are of that criminal organization. And being a foreigner in a, in a country, in other words, if you're, if, if you're Sicilian moving here, you're sticking together and agreeing to those rules and operating by them among yourselves so that organized crime among immigrant groups actually has a unique advantage. Whereas if it's Americans, and there's Americans involved in organized crime, but um, it's not the same thing because the same bonds of loyalty, fear of betrayal, and the rest of it don't exist because you could always just hop on a bus and move to Seattle or something and start over again. Whereas that's hard to do uh, if you're a member of a, um, a, a, a sort of tighter knit immigrant group in a foreign country. And this isn't I'm not even talking about just today. That's true today with Chinese or Central American organized crime. But it was true of Russian organized crime, Sicilian, what have you. In fact, there's this whole book on immigrant organized crime. And the first chapter of it, I forget the title of the book, but the first chapter of it was Australians in San Francisco, apparently. And I'm talking way back, you know, in the 19th century were um, in organized. They were dominating organized crime there, at least for a while. So. That, that part of immigrant criminality is real, but when you look at crime overall, statistically, immigrants aren't especially likely to be criminals. Okay, interesting. So say we cut down on immigration. What do we do about the fact that apparently a quarter of immigrants are illegal? Yeah, about a quarter of immigrants are illegal. And, you know, I'm kind of a squish on amnesty. Um, I'm open to the idea of um, fixing an old problem, sort of starting fresh, but only if you fix the problem that created this illegal population in the first place. In other words, the approach we've had all along, and this was from the 1986 amnesty, the big amnesty that President Reagan signed, and every proposal that's followed since then, is that it starts by amnestying people, and then promises in the future, cross their, heart, cross their hearts and hope to die that they'll enforce the law so we won't have more illegal immigration. Well, that's just a lie. I mean, it's proven to be a lie. It was, I, I, have to, I'm, I don't blame the people in, back in 1986 who agreed to it. 35 years ago was the first time we'd done anything like that. And you know, it seemed like it was worth a try. But we've run that experiment, if you will, like a social what exactly, experiment. Sorry, just before sorry. you continue, what exactly was that experiment? Yeah, what does sorry. that mean? In 1986, uh, after a number of years of going back and forth um, in you know, different legislation in Congress, uh, Congress passed and President Reagan signed uh, what's called the Immigration Reform and Control Act. And what that did was amnesty. About 3 million illegal immigrants is what it ended up being, who were already mm -hmm. here. In exchange for, for the first time ever, making it illegal to employ illegal immigrants. Because before oh, 1986, okay. the law specifically said you were allowed to employ illegal aliens. So that's oh. the magnet that draws people. Uh, I mean, people come because they have relatives. There's a lot of reasons people come, but getting a job is the chief one, is the main thing. So if you can weaken that magnet, um, you can reduce illegal immigration. It's never going to go away, but you can make it a much smaller thing. Well, the problem is the amnesty happened up front. The enforcement never happened. It was a lie to begin with. The people who were pro-amnesty uh, pro knew that they were going to welsh on the deal, do everything they could to prevent, to undermine it. And we now have, what, four times as many illegal immigrants as we did back then. So if we're going to talk about amnesty, and I've written about this for years, that I'm open to it, but we have to have in place, up and running, 
the systems to minimize future illegal immigration. And not to, you know, I'll give you the three point plan, but it's only, I'll yeah. only, only give you a few seconds on each one. First thing is we need to have universal use of what's called the E-Verify program. It's online free program run by the government where when you hire somebody and you take their info for social security and IRS, which you have to do anyway, you just verify it online. Is that name real? Does it match the social security number? Do those match the date of birth? Is it real? Now you can still fool it, but it's a sort of basic good governance thing to make sure that um, you are hiring somebody who's authorized to work. The program exists. About half of people hired, new people hired every year are screened through this system, but the other half aren't, and that's where the illegal aliens are. So that needs to be up and running for everybody. Two, we need a check-in, check-out system for foreign visitors. And I say that because close to half of new illegal aliens in most years are people who came in legally. They had a tourist visa, student visa, whatever it is, and they just never left. And, if, and we don't know who has left. So if you don't know who has checked out and gone back to their home country, you don't know who's still here. We do the check-in part a lot better than we did. 9-11 really woke people up about that. And Congress got serious, government got serious, the check-in part for foreign visitors, screening them and, and, and you know, sort of registering the fact that they've come here is a lot better than it used to be. The check-out part is still kind of a joke. Congress mandated an electronic system to do that check-out uh, 25 years ago. It still hasn't happened. They made some little attempts at it. It's still not in place. So that's number two. That has to be up and running before you can say, okay, we fixed the problem. Now let's clear the decks. And the third thing you have to have is sanctuary cities have to be banned by federal law because the whole point to a sanctuary city is not that it protects immigrants or something. What it does is when local police arrest somebody, say for dealing drugs or beating up his girlfriend or driving drunk, everybody that gets arrested their fingerprints are scanned. It's all done electronically now. It's not when I was a kid, they still had on TV, you know, ink. You take the fingerprints with ink on paper. It's all electronic. It's all scanned now. When the fingerprints are scanned, everybody who's arrested, it goes to the FBI. And now it goes to DHS. That's relatively new in the past few years. So now Homeland Security knows when an illegal immigrant has been arrested. Mm. And what a sanctuary city means is that that city prohibits telling or prohibits cooperating with ICE and handing over this person. Say he's a drunk driver, uh, but and they, they arrested him. There's no question about it, but they didn't have good evidence or they've got too many other cases to trial. So they're not going to try it. They're going to let him go. Well, ICE can say, hey, can you hold on to this guy for 48 hours so we can get him and deport him? Sanctuary cities say, basically, give federal government the finger and say, no, we're protecting criminals who are in the United States. So anyway, that's the third thing that has to be in place, not promised, but in place. Once we do that, I'm open to amnesty. It should be quick, rip off the Band-Aid, get it over with. I think there should be a kind of apology ceremony where the illegal immigrant says, and it should be written in his own language as well, so he understands what he's saying, you know, I broke America's laws by coming here. I don't deserve um, to stay, but the American people have, you know, have graced me with this opportunity and I will, you know, endeavor the rest of my life to make myself worthy of it. And we should never talk about there being illegal aliens, that, that person being an illegal alien again, but it needs to, we need to have something in place so we don't have a mass illegal immigration 10 or 20 years from now. And we have another debate about amnesty. Hmm. Okay. So one question you said, if you come here, you get your passport stamped, you have some sort of visa and you just stay, there's no system in place that tracks how many days you're here. Nope. What? Nothing that tracks you when you leave. Nothing that even, I remember talking to a democratic Senator once, uh, he was, uh, I forget who which, it was. Uh, he was from Delaware. It wasn't Joe Biden. Um, and he said when he was, I think he was former governor he said that they had some kind of program um, when there was some kind of, I don't know whether it was a uh, welfare issue or something, but they would text you, say, hey, your, you know, your hearing yeah. date is coming up or whatever it is. In other words, 
We don't even do that. And he was saying, well, just doing that would get half the people who overstay their visas to leave because we would be telling him, hey, Uncle Sam's paying attention to you. They know, you know, he knows you're here. So make, and you know, if we did something like that, should be a text that says, hope you're enjoying your stay in America. You know, you've uh, got one week left on your period of stay is what it's called when you get at the airport and they stamp your passport. Um, make sure you leave on time because if you don't, you know, it'll be uh, hard to come back in in the future or something like that. Just doing that would in itself reduce visa overstaying significantly because it would be clear that somebody is paying attention. Right now, nobody's paying attention. So what if, okay, this is coming from a Canadian perspective. So we've got the type of visa where you can basically come in, you can't work, but you can stay for, I believe it's up to six months. Yeah, six months is a what year. we do too, usually, yeah. Yeah, um, I assumed, because every time you go, they're like, have you been here for over six months? Or, you know, how many days have you been here? I assumed that was some formality that they were just asking me as like a trick question or something, assuming that there was something on their computer that said this person has been here for you know, 140 days or something, but they're just looking at stamps and a passport and nothing's been. Basically. Yeah. That's I mean, that's, that's, wow. that's what it amounts to. I mean, uh, you know, keep telling the truth. I encourage you to tell the oh, truth, yeah. but, but yeah, it's not hard to fool our immigration system, not because they're stupid, but because it's designed to yeah. not be particularly tight or well run. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Another question, sanctuary cities. So what do those, those, what are those exactly? Are they areas of places? Well, it's usually, it's some jurisdiction. It could be a city, it could be a county, it could even be a whole state like California that the law in, and there's different versions of it, but the base, it, what it boils down to is that the law enforcement in that jurisdiction is not allowed to cooperate with ICE. And now the way this is often presented is that you know, our police aren't immigration agents. That's the federal government's business. Yeah, okay, well, that's true. ICE doesn't want police, local police, to be walking around the neighborhood saying, you know, hey, Paco, where's your green card? The police aren't interested in that. ICE doesn't want people to do that. What the, the practical effect is that when the local police arrest somebody, that person will not face, they will protect that criminal from the immig from immigration consequences. If he's, for instance, a, um, you know, if he's an illegal immigrant, ICE doesn't necessarily know about every illegal immigrant. I mean, if you snuck by the border patrol, nobody saw you, there's no record of your ever having been here. If you get arrested, you know, you may not pop up on ICE's computers, but most illegal immigrants either have come in legally, maybe they got stopped once by the border patrol, thrown back, and then the second time they made it so that their record, they're in the system. In other words, they could have been deported, formally deported, where they go through the whole court system. And if they come back, that, that's a felony to come back after being deported. So that most uh. illegal immigrants who get arrested have some kind of paperwork, um, some kind of record in, in DHS's computers. And what a sanctuary city means, sanctuary policies mean, is that those local or state governments are protecting illegal immigrants or protecting immigrants of whatever kind from the immigration consequences um, of their actions. And that's just wrong. It has nothing to do with protecting ordinary people. And when you press the sanctuary city people on this, they'll say, yeah, nobody should be deported. And if you're a murderer, you should go to jail. And then when you mm. finish your jail term, you should just be let go and allowed to stay here because no one should ever be deported. There's even a hashtag, not one more uh, on Twitter, which one of the advocacy groups was pushing pretty actively in the past. And the point being that they don't think anyone, no matter how criminal they are, should be deported. It's not that they were saying criminals should just always be let go, but that if they're prosecuted, they go to jail. When they finish their jail term, the way the law is supposed to work is they're handed over to Homeland Security and they're thrown out of the country. But these sanctuary city folks think that, you know, any convicted criminal who finished serves his term, he's an illegal immigrant, he should just be let to let go to go and live as an illegal alien again rather than be deported. Did I did I miss any of the main arguments? Is there anything else you want to talk about before? I ask you where people can find you online. No, I think that's the, the main one is that, 
the problem with immigration is not the immigrants. It's that we have changed. Well, let me just, there's one other uh, sort of way of illustrating that. Um, I wrote a book a number of years ago making this argument. And when I sent the draft to my editor, the kind of the thing I opened with was the metaphor, and she made me take this out, so I always add it. I always mention it just to sort of get back at her. <laughs> um, the metaphor I used was donuts. Immigration is like donuts. When you're seven years old, donuts are good for you. You need the fat. You need the sugar. You, your, your brain is growing. Your body is growing. It's good for you. When you're 57 years old, you can't eat donuts like that anymore. There's nothing wrong with the donuts. They're the same donuts. Maybe they're jelly donuts instead of crawlers, but they're still just donuts. What's changed is you, and you're not sick, you're not broken, your metabolism has changed. And so you need to change your diet. And in a sense, this is the same thing where our, the metabolism of the body politic has changed. The immigrants aren't worse, we're not sick or broken, we've outgrown the ability to successfully deal with mass immigration. And mm. we need to um, you know, adjust our policies. The, the federal immigration program is just that, a federal government program. It's like farm subsidies or small business loans or the Air Force. And sometimes it may be bigger. Sometimes it should be smaller. That's what the debate should be about and not sort of in these apocalyptic moral terms where anybody who critiques it is a, you know, an evil uh, racist xenophobe, blah, blah, blah. You've heard all of that stuff before. Um, it's a government policy. We need to debate it, have a normal debate. I probably won't get everything I want, but that's the way it is in democratic politics. But we need to debate this rather than make it some kind of, uh, you know, apocalyptic issue. Yes, I 100 percent agree. I would say most issues out there need to be debated. Otherwise, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, no question about it. OK, Mark, where can people find you if they want to find you online? Uh, the Center for Immigration Studies. I'm the executive director. We're online at cis.org. We have a blog with new postings every day. We also have a weekly podcast called Parsing Immigration Policy. It's on our website, but it's also in all the usual podcast places. And if you have a taste for snark and sarcasm, I'm on Twitter at Mark S, as in Stephen, Mark S. Krikorian. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. That was interesting. Happy to do it.